December 12th, 2023, and we're convening for a council work session on the city's draft 2024 federal legislative and regulatory agenda, as well as our draft 2024 state legislative agenda. 
The Office of Government Relations is here to provide their insights into the political landscape in Oregon and Washington, D.C. I really look forward to that uh, description and provide recommendations for the city's federal and state priorities in 2024. I'll now turn this over to our incredible Director of Government Relations, Sam Chase, to lead us through today's work session and introduce his team. Welcome, Sam. Well, thank you so much, Mayor, and I especially appreciate the uh, extra enthusiasm for this work session this morning. Um, uh, we're uh, uh, pretty excited to bring uh, our, our uh, materials to you. My name is Sam Chase. I'm the direct uh, and good morning. Also, commissioners. My name is Sam Chase. I am the director for the Office of Government Relations. I use he him pronouns. We're here to talk about the state and federal advocacy agendas for 2024. We'll start with introductions of the office and our work. You'll hear about the work of the grants, opportunities, and advancement team. We will discuss the 2024 agenda development process and our transition to a biennial development process. Then move to the discussion of the 2024 agendas. We will have Jack Ariaga and Vicki Cram discuss the federal agenda. Following, we'll have Evan Mitchell and Dan Bates discuss the state agenda. They will introduce members of their team, teams. We have planned extra time for discussion at the end, but we welcome questions along the way. Uh, there are some key functions to our government relations work that I'd like to point out, as I hope you've, been, you've seen throughout the year in working with our team, uh, seeking collaboration, moving toward consensus, achieving a unified voice are common drivers for OGR's processes and standards. Before we move in uh, deeper into our presenta presentation, I also wanna intentionally highlight the work of other areas of OGR that overlap with our federal and state work. OGR staff development, a number of new staff joined the OGR team at the beginning of the year. And I, I wanna thank you. We felt truly welcomed by the city and wanna thank you and your staff for that. We heard a couple of things that stuck out for me when we first started. One, externally, Externally, elected leaders uh, at the state and local level levels expressed the need for the city to act with a unified voice. And internally, we need to support and retain high quality staff. We've made tremendous progress in those areas. And at the same time, continuous improvement in these areas and more will always be part of OGR's values. Uh, our regional advocacy and, and local government advocacy to help secure uh, we secured $20.7 million in funding for task program. Uh, I am also very optimistic about the city's conversations with uh, Oregon Housing and Community Services to fund operations for the Clinton Triangle, 140 low barrier pod units at the Clinton Triangle. We expect a decision shortly and um, you know that work between the regional and state work and educating and getting people to understand our needs, such a critical relationship. We also have international relations program, and uh, it represents the city with our nine sister cities and other international allies. It highlights this year include three outbound international delegations, as well as hosting 31 incoming delegations and the sister cities reception here at City Hall. The tribal relations program helped facilitate a council led delegation to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. We also set forth goals for incorporating the tribal relations program into the city's future organizational structure. Uh, we will be launching a new search for the tribal relations program manager very shortly. And then finally, uh, and then we have the new uh, OGR strategic plan process that we are uh, have underway with uh, uh, a plan hopefully ready to present to you uh, in winter uh, towards the end of the winter 2024. And then finally on collaboration and partnerships, this is a principle that OGR operates by and has examples from every area of our work. I think everybody uh, on this uh, uh, meeting uh, has probably heard me talk about this, uh, the, the importance of this to OGR. Uh, I wanna take a moment to thank you and your staff. This is probably a good time to mention that together we have engaged in the Governor's Central City Task Force since the beginning. Uh, we are enthusiastic about the opportunities to to align elements of those recommendations with our state 
legislative agenda and will be actively engaged in the legislature's decisions. The recommendations really fall into a couple of buckets on the task force. And I'll just take a moment here to reflect since we were just got those recommendations yesterday. Uh, there are a number of those uh, recommendations that align very well because you have been champions and advocating for those since the beginning of the year. And it's great to see some progress and support and others leaning in to support that. That uh, is the temporary alternative shelter sites, uh, more shelter and a call for more shelter in general, a ban on public use of dangerous and deadly drugs, a stronger public safety presence through partnerships with Oregon State Police, fully funding our request for ODOT cleanup funds, and attention to the growing tax burden on Portland's residents and business. You did the work to identify these needs. You set that agenda uh, to, to, you know, uh, you uh, have been able to articulate their importance uh, to um, uh, the, the community at large, other elected officials at large, other government bodies at large. Uh, and you've shown up in the legislature and you've participated in the governor's task force. And I just wanna call out that those are, 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 are really strong elements of the, um, of your work that you, you brought forward. And, and it, it, it's, it's really nice to see the, the governor and the task force leaning in on those. Now, the other bucket is there are a range of uh, uh, additional task force recommendations. OGR will work with you, the task force participants, governor's office to better understand those recommendations and to evaluate those additional recommendations. We look forward to doing that work with you. Now, uh, I will turn it over to folks on our team. I'm gonna turn it over to Kari Schlossauer uh, of OGR's Grant Opportunity and Advancement Team. Thank you, Director Chase. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Kari Schlossauer, she, her, and I'm Senior Associate for OGR's Grant Opportunities Advancement Team. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about our work. Over the past two years, our team has stood up a citywide grant research and development program, building and maintaining a citywide database of state and federal competitive funding opportunities to share with Bureau partners. We're a team of two, myself and my colleague, Haley Tortorella, that meets regularly with bureaus and offices, tracks discretionary grant funds, applied for and received, coordinates cross bureau conversations on funding opportunities, and supports government relations with regional partners. The team is a resource and first point of contact to bureaus citywide for research and grant analysis for federal and state competitive grants related to citywide needs. As a result, the city has a better understanding of the landscape of competitive grant opportunities available to meet our needs and is on the path to becoming more well-coordinated in assessing and submitting successful grant applications. We've been coordinating efforts across bureaus for funding opportunities related to climate and resilience, transportation safety and electrification, and to streamline opportunities for affordable housing, among other things. In addition to sharing discretionary funding opportunities directly for city priorities, bureaus such as Prosper have been able to distribute funding opportunities to businesses and community partners to assist in bolstering Portland's economy and livability. Of the grants we track, in fiscal year 22-23, the city was awarded approximately 77 million in competitive grants applied for, compared with an average of about 50 million in similar competitive grants in the past fiscal years. That's an increase of 52%. In the calendar year 2023 to date, the city submitted 50 applications for competitive funding, including earmarks and state, regional, and federal discretionary funds. Uh, award notifications take time, as many of you know, and today, the city has received 12 successful notifications. For example, PBOT has received multiple grants for more than 38 million in competitive funding awards focused on safety, access, and livability. The Police Bureau was recently awarded a Smart Policing Initiative grant for $800,000. And the Parks Bureau received 2 million from FEMA for tree expansion across the city. Of the grants we're still waiting on a notification, there are, among other things, two PBOT neighborhood access and equity grants that will equal nearly $75 million. One in the Chloe neighborhood and one in the rural Albina, Rose Porter area. There's also a shared workforce grant between BES, the Bureau of Environmental Services, and the Bureau of Transportation for $1 million. And there are six requests for congressionally directed spending, which will bring the city more than $8 million for housing, community safety, and the livability. In sum, our team is working regularly and closely with bureaus and offices to match available funding with city priorities to offset general fund allocations. 
as well as tracking state and federal opportunities such as political housing, emergency shelters, fire prevention, and the White House's violence prevention initiative. Thank you for your time. I'll now pass the presentation back to Deputy the Director of Special. Thank you, Kari. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> My name is Neil Silstrom. I am the Deputy Director in the Office of Government Relations, and I use uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, I wanted to uh, first go over how we as OGR work best with the city and for the city. <clears throat> uh, OGR's mission is to serve city council and the city's bureaus in providing strategic advice and lobbying to advance the city's uh, policy goals in Salem and Washington, D.C. through our state and federal relations programs. We provide effective representation, strategic advice, and quality service to council and all city bureaus. And by doing this, uh, or as we do this, uh, the city has adopted a administrative rule to guide the coordination of government relations. And the rule recognizes that ad hoc uh, advocacy and tribal relations could have an adverse or an adverse impact on the success of the city of city in, of the cities promoting its overall goals. For these reasons, all legislative and tribal affairs activities shall be coordinated and managed through the Office of Government Relations, and, and that's Administrative Rule 3.01. Uh, additionally, we work very hard to develop agendas that leverages the full support of City Council, because we know we do best when the city is in consensus and speaks with one voice. And this helps provide clear messaging to our stakeholders and clear direction to our team and our legislative partners, which is essential for success. Oops, pardon me. As an office, we know that prioritizing equity and anti-racism is paramount to achieving outcomes on policies that are impactful to Portlanders. In the last 18 months, we've developed an equity rubric to help assess proposed agenda items uh, and hope to fully implement it during the next agenda setting process. These rubric scores the intended impact opportunities to repair harm, and the level of community engagement by bureaus on their proposed agenda items. Throughout the agenda development process and during our advocacy efforts, we connect and work with individuals and organizations that serve as a voice for underrepresented communities and work to find collective approaches to advocacy that fully lift all Portland residents. And as uh, Director Chase mentioned, we are going to be adapting our agenda development process uh, to a biennial process to align with the work, the calendars and workloads of the state and federal legislative cycles. Both the draft 2024 state agenda and draft 2024 federal agenda before you today are refinements of the council adopted 2023 agendas that have seen changes based on legislative accomplishments and input from council offices, bureaus, and stakeholders. The 2025 agenda setting process will begin in the spring of 2024 as opposed to the summer's uh, time frame, and we will configure our structure and process to work with a new form of government. Additionally, we are considering the steps it would take to, to create a local government and regional government advocacy agenda. I would now like to hand it off to the Federal Relations Program Manager uh, Jack Ariaga to go over the draft 2024 federal legislative and regulatory agenda. Thank you, Niels. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Again, for the record, my name is Jack Ariaga. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Federal Relations Manager in the Office of Government Relations. Uh, the, city's, the City of Portland's 2024 Federal Legislative and Regulatory Agenda prioritizes policy, funding, and regulatory requests that address the most pressing needs of the city and its residents. The agenda is an outward-facing document to provide the city's position to our congressional delegation and to the Biden administration. It also serves as a consensus work plan approved by Council that allows our federal program to move nimbly in response to the great number of opportunities and requests at the national and federal level. In a few minutes, I'll walk you through the highlights of the draft agenda and suggested updates that we've been crafting with your offices and bureaus. But first, I'll hand it off to Vicki Cram to provide some context for our work with the federal government on behalf of the city and the climate within which that work will occur. Vicki? 
Thanks so much, Jack. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, I'm Vicki Cram. I'm a principal at Squire Patton Boggs. I use she, her pronouns. Um, so this slide and the next one are a quick refresher on the delegation and their committee assignments. As you will recall, the decennial census gave Oregon a six seat um, majority, gave, gave Oregon a six seat and redistricting impacted um, all of the other boundaries. Uh, Congresswoman Bonamici has dedicated increased focus on Portland since her share of the city grew last year. Congressman Chavez, Congresswoman Chavez Dreamer has a small portion, and Congresswoman Salinas has an even smaller portion of the city. In this coming year, there will be no changes to the delegation and their committee assignments. And of course, Congressman Blumenauer has announced his retirement at the end of this Congress. He has served in Congress since 1996 and has devoted his career to being a tireless advocate for his district and the city. The next slide shows the senators and their um, committee assignments. And then the next slide uh, is what to expect in 2024. Um, so the 118th Congress has proven to be the least productive in US history. And we expect more of the same with the election coming. In fact, this Congress has only passed 22 laws and is on pace to pass about 36.5 by January 2025. This is significantly less than the 617 laws passed on average since 1935. Congress is currently trying to fund the military and finalize a deal on foreign aid and border security. Um, and they'll leave for the holidays as soon as they reach an agreement or fail to. Um, they may meet one, reach one on military aid, but they may fail on the foreign aid side of it. But they'll have a full plate when they return. Government funding expires for twenty percent of the for twenty percent of the federal government on January nineteenth, and for everything else on February second. As a result, FY twenty twenty four funding will be the first thing up next year. Once the FY 2024 funding is law, the FY 2025 funding process will immediately begin. For us, this means submitting FY 2025 funding priorities to the delegation to ensure inclusion in the next round of funding. A number of early departures on the Republican side will make partisan votes harder for the new speaker, Mike Johnson. While that should lead to more compromise, it's actually kind of doubtful. In all probability, things will slow down a bit more. We expect, though, that Congress will reauthorize the Federal Aviation Administration, the National Flood Insurance Program, the Farm Bill, which contains a lot of nutrition programs, as well as military funding. Beyond that, it will be politics, not policy, ruling the day. With major divisive election approaching, we expect the Repub House Republicans to try to pass messaging bills to aid their re-elections and hurt President Biden wherever possible. Democrats will have to work to constantly keep Republicans from undoing any of the White House's signature achievements, such as the American Recovery Plan, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. With the election coming, the administration will seek to finalize as many regulations as possible so that they're in place should President Biden fail to be reelected. And with a bitterly divided House and Senate, we do not expect a particularly fruitful lame duck session, which is likely to occur at the end of next year after the election, though depending on the outcome, potentially Congress could address the debt limit before it expires on January 1st, 2025. Um, so with that summary, I'm going to turn it back over to Jack to walk through the uh, federal agenda. Jack. Thank you, Vicki. So as we turn our attention to the draft 2024 federal legislative and regulatory agenda, uh, you'll recall that it is organized into seven priority areas that are structured to reflect the shared priorities of the Portland City Council. They are developing new models for community safety and behavioral health, addressing homelessness and housing stability, supporting economic recovery and development, advancing racial justice and civil rights, achieving climate and environmental justice, securing infrastructure investment, 
and maintaining local authority and opposing preemption. And here, you, of course, you see a, a good looking uh, group of, of local uh, government ser public servants uh, advocating for our agenda in DC. As we work through these priorities, uh, I'll focus primarily on agenda items where we have had successes in the past year and areas where we see the greatest need or opportunities for increased engagement in 2024. I'll also note where specific changes to our previous year's agenda have been proposed for 2024. Of course, I'm happy to answer any questions along the way. And finally, before we dive into the agenda, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of my colleagues once again on OGR's grant opportunities and advancement team, Kari Schlosshauer and Haley Tortorella. Their work has been vital to much of the pro federal program's success in the past year. This includes supporting the federal program in submitting the nine requests to our congressional delegation for federally earmarked funding, of which six are still advancing through the ongoing appropriations process. And as Kari mentioned, those earmarks are anticipated to directly fund more than $8 million of community safety, housing, and livability work within the city. Given the dynamics in Washington, D.C. that make it challenging to achieve policy outcomes, their work to help the city strategically pursue federal funding opportunities will remain instrumental in achieving results on our agenda in the coming year. With that, the first priority area in our agenda is community safety and behavioral health. The, submit, the city is committed to advocating for policies that enhance safety for all Portlanders, expand access to critical behavioral health and substance use services, and stem the supply of dangerous controlled substances. The city is advocating for federal funding and policies to develop public safety solutions that best fit the needs of our community and allow Portlanders to feel safe. So that is why the city will also encourage federal action to uh, adequately address behavioral health needs including access to mental health services, substance abuse treatments, and other supports. Priorities in this area in include increasing federal resources and coordination to support the interdiction of interstate drug trafficking, particularly fentanyl and methamphetamines. This was a new agenda item in the last year, so much of our engagement sought to inform the congressional delegation of the city's perspective and local enforcement efforts through opportunities like staff ride-alongs with the Portland Police Bureau's bike squad, uh, and other engagements. The, the scourge of transnational flow, the scourge of the transnational flow of fentanyl continues to receive increasing attention from our federal partners at the national level and more locally. From President Biden's recent bilateral engagements with the leaders of China and Mexico to the congressional delegation's involvement in the governor's central city task force, we see significant opportunity in the coming year to keep pressing for greater coordination and dedication of resources to support the city's efforts in addressing the rampant influx of dangerous drugs. In the months ahead, we will also keep working to support Portland Street Response's mission of responding to low acuity behavioral health and non-emergency medical calls. Our delegation has been supportive of expanding mobile crisis response services like PSR while recognizing that it's only one link of a care continuum that needs to be strengthened from top to bottom. Senator Ron Wyden has been particularly engaged on this issue, and the city will keep working with his office and other partners to identify opportunities for further collaboration. Advocating for increased funding of local gun violence prevention programs will also continue to be a priority. In the past year, the Community Safety Division and the Office of Violence Prevention have received funding from multiple federal sources to support their expanding work including a $2 million earmark secured by Congressman Blumenauer to help launch the Safe Blocks program. And with the White House creating a new Office of Gun Violence Prevention this past September, we'll be closely monitoring additional opportunities to receive federal support for our local efforts. Finally, our agenda will continue to urge federal requirements for seismic upgrades to critical energy infrastructure facilities. I've noted this item on the slide because I anticipate it will receive increased attention from members of our congressional delegation in the coming year. So this presents another opportunity for the city to be a proactive partner. The next priority area is addressing homelessness and housing stability. As council often emphasizes, meeting the needs of those experiencing homelessness and lacking access to stable, affordable housing is a high priority for the city of Portland. Our work spans beyond funding for essential, for essential federal affordable housing programs and rental assistance into tackling the root causes of homelessness, 
including but not limited to access to behavioral health services and workforce training. Unfortunately, progress at the federal level was limited in the last year and will likely remain so for the foreseeable future. However, Council's ongoing determination to respond to homelessness and housing insecurity with urgency will continue to guide our strong advocacy for solutions. Of course, we do have several accomplishments from the past year we can celebrate. Uh, this year, the city used federal funds from the American Rescue Plan Act to purchase surplus federal property, namely the Sears Armory, avoiding disruption to the Monoma Safe Rest Village site that was also funded by ARPA dollars. The city also received an earmark of $2 million in community development block grant funding towards the preservation and rehabilitation of the Fairfield Apartments. As we see in this photo from the groundbreaking event, Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici led the effort to secure that funding with support from Senators Wyden and Merkley. Earlier this year, HUD also awarded the Joint Office of Homeless Services an $8.3 million grant to expand its work addressing unsheltered homelessness. This grant will fund permanent supportive housing for 81 households over three years, matching rent assistance with wraparound services that include enhanced behavioral health and peer outreach to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. The city has been, a pro, has been proactive in supporting bipartisan efforts to expand the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, or LIHTC, led in part by Senator Wyden as chair of the Senate Finance Committee. And in the coming year, we will keep advocating that additional federal funds be dedicated for HUD housing vouchers, rental and mortgage assistance, and enhanced eviction and foreclosure prevention. Next is economic recovery and development. Though inflation has slowed in the last year and the job market remains strong, national and global economic challenges continue to create uncertainty and impose burdens for many Portland households and businesses. As such, the City of Portland will advocate for federal resources, policies, and practices that support equitable wealth creation, providing opportunity and a vibrant city life to meet the economic needs of all Portlanders, while prioritizing historically marginalized populations. Key items here include supporting the creation of a federal qualified office conversion tax credit to assist downtown revitalization. With the Biden administration increasing its efforts to support commercial to residential conversions and Senator Wyden's finance committee staff actively seeking input on this topic from us and other local stakeholders, we have willing partners at the federal level and I'm optimistic that we can identify opportunities in the coming year that may help tip the scales on certain conversion projects. We will also continue working closely with the community technology team in BPS on increasing digital equity and inclusion through broadband deployment. Historic federal funding for broadband is expected to primarily benefit rural areas in the near term, but the city of Portland has persistently engaged our federal and state partners to ensure equitable allocation of these resources. For example, Senators Whiten and Merkley are supporting a pending earmark request of $1 million for community technology to create a small business digital training program. Now, supporting for the National Endowments for the Arts and Humanities has long been a part of the city's federal agenda, but this year we are proposing to broaden the language uh, to capture council support for artists and the arts in general, uh, including as drivers of economic activity and magnets for in-person gatherings that stoke downtown re revitalization. This language will further empower us to support the efforts of our delegation, particularly Congresswoman Bonamici, who recently reintroduced her Arts Education for All Act. And finally, there may be opportunity in the coming year to advocate for increased funding of programs through WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, to expand job training and support dislocated workers and provide placement assistance. So the next priority area is racial justice and civil rights. The city of Portland is advocating for anti-racist public policy at the federal level to strive for more equitable outcomes for our community members. The city recognizes and acknowledges the impact of public policy that lead to inequitable outcomes and will advocate to the federal government on several issues. This includes supporting efforts in concert with tribal partners to preserve the rights of tribal members and their descendants with respect to tribal sovereignty and self-governance secured under Indian treaties, executive orders, and benefits to which they are entitled under the laws, treaties, and constitution of the United States. 
One example of this, uh, council can continue to encourage support for the U.S. Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding Schools Act, which has not yet been reintroduced in the House of Representatives. As council may recall, this bill would establish the first formal commission in United States history to investigate, document, and acknowledge past injustices of the federal government's cultural genocide and assimilation practices. Council has provided support for this bill in the past and can do so again in the coming year. Other agenda items that warrant continued engagement in the year ahead include codifying and expanding protections under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival Program, enacting comprehensive immigration reform, strengthening protections under the Voting Rights Act, and ensuring voter access through expanded early voting and vote by mail. I would also note that some of our most promising opportunities for achieving success in advancing equity and racial justice to actually lie elsewhere in the city's federal agenda. For example, PBOT is seeking nearly $40 million through the Biden administration's Neighborhood Access and Equity Program to improve Northeast Broadway in the Lower Albina neighborhood. And in partnership with Albina Vision Trust, PBOT closely coordinated with ODOT to complement their ambition, ODOT's ambitious application under the same program for the Rose Quarter Improvement Project. With council supporting both the PBOT and ODOT applications, these projects may soon receive tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to restore the black community whose homes were destroy destroyed to make way for I-5 and other projects. Next, we have climate and environmental justice. Here, the city is uh, committed to swiftly reducing carbon emissions and transitioning to a clean energy future while reducing energy costs for low-income individuals and the most vulnerable in our community. The city will safeguard the environment and public health, building resilience and stabilities for Portlanders, especially those who have been historically marginalized and overburdened by past infrastructure and transportation decisions. The city recognizes this is a critical juncture and we will continue to pursue federal support with urgency, specifically to reflect the unparalleled opportunities created by the Inflation Reduction Act we are proposing to add a new agenda item to this year's federal agenda to advance the goals of the city's climate emergency work plan by securing federal funding to support implementation of energy efficiency and clean energy production projects using technologies such as renewable hydrogen, solar, wind, and geothermal. We will also continue supporting federal investment in reducing carbon output through transportation sector innovations and facility, facilitating an equitable transition away from fossil fuels. On this point, I'd like to call out PBOT's work to implement the first enforced zero emissions delivery zone in the United States. This innovative project was awarded a $2 million grant from the US Department of Transportation. The city will keep pursuing opportunities for investment in climate resiliency projects, such as mitigating extreme heat and preventing wildfire. As another example of Portland's leadership in this area, pictured here is Kavita Hain, uh, who in September was invited to represent the Water Bureau at the White House Summit on Building Climate Resilient Communities. I'll note that this priority item also includes floodplain restoration, where this year we are recommending the addition of mitigation banking as a named priority. We will also continue working closely with the congressional delegation to fund environmentally important Willamette River Basin watershed restoration projects in partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This year, we suggest adding specific mentions to the agenda of Johnson Creek, which recently received a federal interest determination from the Corps, and Tryon Creek, where our senators are currently working to secure an earmark, earmark at the city's request that will allow the Corps to complete its planning work and move towards construction. Finally, the city will continue to leverage the U.S. Forest Service's Urban and Community Forestry Program to help sustain trees and forests where people live, work, and play. As Kari previously mentioned, the city's Urban Forestry Program was recently awarded a $2 million FEMA BRIC grant to increase climate resiliency by equitably expanding our tree canopy. But they have also separately partnered with Friends of Trees and the Oregon Department of Forestry to apply for these US Forest Service funds uh, made available by the Inflation Reduction Act. With Friends of Trees winning nearly $12 million and the state being awarded about $23 million, much of that funding will go towards projects within Portland. The next priority is infrastructure investment. 
When it comes to investing in infrastructure, the city believes a strong federal partner is essential for the health and safety of the public and the environment and for the growth of the local economy. This is where the city achieved some of its greatest success in the past year, as well as where increasing challenges have led us to propose some of the most sub substantive additions to the federal agenda. First, we've been very focused on ensuring that the implementation of funding opportunities and programs in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act supports city interests in meeting safety, equity, and climate, as well as mobility goals. As Kari mentioned, this includes the city winning more than $38 million in competitive federal grants to support those investments in electric vehicle, electric vehicle infrastructure, bridge upgrades, and safety improvements. However, we've received feedback from our infrastructure bureaus that these significant opportunities often stretch staff capacity and require the dedication of scarce resources while providing little or no support for the base operations of those bureaus. That is why this year we're seeking to add an agenda item to increase support for federal investment and policy support for the maintenance and operation of existing infrastructure systems. So over the coming year, we will work with our delegation to try and seek those flexibilities. We also propose adding city support for the development and implementation of a federal mileage-based road user fee to ensure the transportation revenue is not further reduced by vehicle decarbonization. We will also work with uh, partners to, to identify federal funding opportunities for the Broadway Corridor, uh, OMSI District Development, and Lloyd Center Redevelopment Projects, and we'll support funding requests for upgrades to Union Station. We also propose a minor language tweak to encourage expanding the safe uh, drinking water and clean water state revolving funds to make them more useful for the city's drinking water, wastewater, stor and stormwater capital projects particularly making cybersecurity, workforce development, and mitigation banking eligible uses of those funds. And finally, the last uh, priority area in the draft agenda is maintaining local authority and opposing preemption. Uh, local authority is critical to the city of Portland's ability to respond nimbly and effectively to both local community and city operational needs. The city opposes any efforts that would curtail the ability to develop and enforce local ordinances and voter approved measures to manage its bureaus and their functions or to maintain and raise revenue consistent with the city's principles and values. Luckily, this section will be very brief because there was not much federal activity in this space that required defensive opposition in the past year. One agenda item we were most engaged on was protecting local authority to manage the public right of way for telecommunications, broadband, and cable facilities. This came in the form of actively opposing a bill introduced in the House of Representatives, misleadingly named the American Broadband Deployment Act, which, among many other concerning provisions, would preempt local right of way and permitting management while likely failing to achieve its stated, stated objective of increasing uh, the deployment of broadband infrastructure. Fortunately, while that, that bill has moved through the, the its committee in the House, it does not appear to be imminent for a floor vote anytime soon. And finally, I wanted to highlight the ongoing agenda item of establishing strong federally, federal privacy protections for individuals while allowing cities to responsibly deploy technologies that best serve their communities. I anticipate this topic will receive increased attention in the coming year potentially including opportunities for engagement on consumer privacy, biometric data collection and distribution, surveillance policies, and facial recognition technologies. So with that, that concludes the overview of the draft 2024 federal legislative and regulatory agenda. I'd be happy to take any questions before we hand it over to the, the state relations team. Um, number one, hi, folks, Mengus here. Uh, thank you for the presentation uh, and your advocacy on behalf of the city. Um, on the federal agenda, um, one of the things I'm curious about, and I'd love to get uh, staff's perspective on, is what does the city of Portland lose as um, Congressman Blumenhauer retires? How does that change the landscape for us? Yeah, well, I, I'd invite Vicky to comment as well. Uh, I think you know she's she's been working with him uh, longer than I I have. But 
you know, the congressman has obviously been a pretty fierce and dedicated public servant for uh, longer than I've been alive, I think. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, he he not only brings, I think, a tenacity uh, that will be met, missed, um, but, you know, a lot of institutional wisdom. Uh, I would particularly point out that, that with the retirement of Chairman Peter DeFazio last session of Congress, uh, we have now, uh, you know, basically lost a ton of our institutional knowledge and leadership and, and frankly, seniority in Congress uh, on infrastructure issues. And so I, I think, you know, with Congressman Blumenauer's particular focus on, on the environment and uh, multimodal transportation, including uh, bicycling and streetcar, I think those are areas where the city has, has traditionally been a, a leader and had a very, very strong federal partner in Congressman Blumenauer that we'll have to uh, look elsewhere to, to find that support now, um, which we do have elsewhere in the delegation, but nobody quite with uh, Congressman Blumenauer's, you know, <laughs> just in, in encyclopedic knowledge on those issues. So, Vicki, anything you would add? Thanks, Jack. I would just uh, sort of echo some of Jack's words. The work he's done on streetcars, not only in Portland, but in other cities around the nation, uh, on marijuana and the Safe Banking Act and, and the MORE Act. Um, and then, of course, uh, his advocacy for bikes and alternative forms of transportation, low carbon impact transportation. Um, you know, his, he's been a leader in Congress on all these, all these issues. So he will create a huge hole, uh, I think, in Congress, not only for the city and for us, um, but also just for the nation in general. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. Or Jack, did you cool. Something? Could I just quickly add? I really want to you know, stress for council, though. You know, he is going to be here for another year, and I think that's a great opportunity for us to really lean on him yeah. uh, to try and you know get his support uh, for the some of the hard things we're we're trying to accomplish. Because you know, as I think you may have all seen in his retirement announcement, he is really wanting to focus locally uh, and provide any kind of support and, and wisdom he can uh, to help solve some of our problems. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Jack and Vicki, uh, for that. Um, I do think that uh, losing Earl, at least in Washington, will be um, a real loss for um, Oregon, Portland, and frankly, the nation. And Mr. Mayor and colleagues, um, one idea that's been rolling around my my head um, is that it might be appropriate to invite uh, Congressman Blumenhauer to uh, come and address council. I'd love to um, hear his perspective on the challenges that the the challenges and opportunities that the city faces, especially as the um, congressman enters his last year um, in D.C. I'd love uh, for us to work together, um, and I'd also love to uh, pick his brain on how we can make Portland an even better city. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Jack. And thank you, Vicki. That was a good report. And it was great to meet with you a couple weeks ago on these topics. And you won't be surprised at my first question. Um, it's around uh, the fentanyl crisis. And I think it was encouraging to listen to the governor, uh, I would say, catch up with the city council on what we've been dealing with on our streets and starting to see that that much needed alignment that we've been hoping for at the city from our local um, electeds, state electeds, and now federal. My question is, uh, the depth of this crisis it is at our borders, is international, and the sophistication and the political will to really address it consistently, who is that champion in our delegation? I right now don't know who that is. So I would I would be <laughs> I would have a hard time sing singling out a, a single individual. I think you know in in almost every arena that I've uh, seen the the congressional delegation speaking broadly, um, you know they, they they hit on this issue as a top concern. Um, I think I would divide it. You know the, my answer up into it sort of depends on which piece of the the puzzle you're focusing on. I think Senator Wyden, you know, as the the Dean of our, our, the most senior member of our delegation um, and the chair of the finance committee has has a lot of power to engage in some of the you know, sort of national and international components of this, you know, as a leader on trade, I think that's a strong leverage point. 
Um, so, you know, I know it's a, a great concern for him and he spoke at the, the summit yesterday about um, engaging on, on trying to, to reduce some of the, um, you know, shipping of small packages and, and um, help DHS address that, that aspect of the problem. When it comes to you know children and education, Congresswoman Bonamici is a, a a major leader, and so I think if we're talking about you know youth prevention and those kinds of efforts, um, you know the, the I would look to her. And then you know I would say several members of the delegation are equally positioned uh, to to be involved and lead on on some of the behavioral health and substance use treatment uh, sides of this. Um, I would say I think in terms of you know some of our Council priorities around increasing federal co coordination with law enforcement. Uh, I think those the, with federal law enforcement, those relationships exist but could be strengthened. And I think there's opportunity to to further increase our coordination um, and and get the the to invite the delegation to I think be more more proactively involved or you know uh, in in providing support. However, I think the challenge for us at the city and you all as council is a figure out specific ways we can invite them to engage. Cause I think we, you know, just asking them to, to get involved uh, is good, but having specific asks would, would go a long way to, to getting for getting results. Jack, that was, thank you. I, I mean, when we met, I, I do think I felt listened to cause I did see this more prevalent now in this version. Um, when I looked at the rough draft, it really, it was hard to find. And so I think that starts with us. And so um, I actually think uh, Congress, uh, Congressman Blumenauer has a chance in his final uh, trip around uh, Congress, um, one more, another year of service to really go hard on this. Portland is known, unfortunately, as Exhibit A on this in very deep ways. And so a former city commissioner um, who's been in Congress for a long time, you know, I think it, providing him with um, uh, more information, uh, more opportunities to be that champion would be really important. My point is, I, I just want to make sure that our Portland delegation uh, is consistent and aligned with what is uh, the number one crisis hit facing our city, which is the poisonous drugs that are killing people. And I hate when those lights go out and killing the um, the, the soul of our city. So I'm, I'm glad that that uh, was uh, now on the agenda. And let's continue to focus on that and be strategic about who could we can partner with um, to constantly be on message about that. The other one that I was pleased to see, of course, is um, having arts in the economic development category. And I, 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 we have to go beyond the NEA, and we all know that. What's really happening right now, and I think it's fine that we're doing more activities, but what's really occurring in our city is our beloved established arts organizations are on a uh, lifeline and they are if they go under you think uh what's the uh, challenging about our evening and weekend economy today it's going to be much worse if they go under and so we need some lifeline support um for our uh, arts organizations and if there was any way that we could get um, on message about that opportunity that would be very important um, as we move forward this uh, this year in terms of supporting our arts organizations. The funds that we have through um, the city's uh, RAC program that, that we've been partnered with for years just won't do it. We're going to need to find extra money for our actual arts organizations from both feds and at the state level. And so I just want to constantly be reminded of that. Again, I think the activation is fine, but it doesn't ring very, it's not as supportive our arts organizations see that as great. It's wonderful to have uh, people downtown, but they really need people to buy tickets to go to their events and to go to their performances. And um, their their subscriptions are pretty far down. It's connected to the first item, uh, the drug crisis that we experience in the city, especially downtown. But we um, are in a place where we have to go um, really hard in our lobbying to save our um, beloved arts organizations. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Jack. i very happy to see the focus on fentanyl and the drug crisis uh, at the federal level. You know, as you recall, when we made the trip back in the spring to D.C., really for economic development purposes, uh, I raised, I think, in every meeting the fentanyl crisis on our streets. And 
uh, it's a very different environment now. It feels like politically than it was at that time. And I, I see that as progress. It also speaks to the the realities of the crisis uh, uh, in, in many respects, but I'm happy to see um, that movement. In, in your mind, what could we expect is the most tangible manifestations at the legislative level of that uh, new focus um, in the coming year? And I, I say that because at the law enforcement level, you know, local coordination with FBI and, and Department of Justice and others, um, you know, I, I do think there's already steps occurring. I think there's more that can be done there. Um, and speaking somewhat to Commissioner Ryan's point, like that, you know, that that's that there's an element that's on us here at the city to making sure um, we're facilitating mutual aid, we're facilitating that coordination as effectively as possible. And that we're clearly communicating to the world our commitment to um, you know the law enforcement aspect of addressing the the drug crisis uh, on our streets, but at the legislative level, I guess I'm curious to hear what you think is going to be what we can expect in the next 13 months. And I'll make one other observation before you answer that question. When we were there in the spring, it was really telling to me that we would often hear from. Uh, Republican representatives in the congressional uh, delegation, um, real understanding of the law enforcement component, but lack of appreciation of the behavioral health component of, of the drug crisis that we're facing. And when we talked to Democrats in our congressional delegation, it was the opposite, the fully appreciation, more intuitive appreciation of the behavioral health components of the crisis. And at the time, it felt like an underappreciation for the for the the law enforcement component. And from my vantage point, we need both. I mean, it's not it's not an either or. It's it's it, it's it, it truly truly is both. But um, so that's more of an observation. But I'm just curious what you think next 13 months. You know what we can expect. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I'll hand it off to Vicky uh, in a moment to to help expand. I think in reaction to, to your observation there, I you know I think that's a a product of of partisan politics, where oftentimes you know parties are sort of driven to to a corner and to acknowledge the the validity or or you know the um uh, you know validity of, of the other side's points is is anathema. Um, I think that's that's changing, and and so there's opportunity you know at the federal level. I think legislatively, you know, Congress has mostly been focused on the sort of behavioral health side, and there has been progress made in recent years there, um, but you know, I, I think on the, the enforcement side, we're going to be looking much more towards the executive branch, frankly. Um, and I think the Biden, Biden administration using existing tools. Um, and I think that's where some of our, our engagement can be most fruitful. Um, I think right now, Vicky can, can expand on this, but one of the areas of, of most opportunity legislatively might be around focusing some of the, you know, current debate around immigration and border security, I think, you know, there's a lot of issues that get conflated there. Um, and one of the message is that, you know, we've been sharing to the delegation is, you know, that perhaps there's some bipartisan opportunity to separate out, you know, the, the actual flow of, of drugs, which mostly comes through ports of entry and legal, you know, it means that, you know, like Senator Wyden said, small packages being shipped directly uh, you know, th that that's actually where a lot of it's coming from. And so focusing on that issue um, might yield some some bipartisan results. So Vicki, could you expand on your perspective? Yeah, happy to. Um, and, I, you know, the, as we all know, the majority of the precursor chemicals come from China and then are synthesized in Mexico um, and then smuggled across the border, as Jack just said. So the administration has been really on top of this um, a lot. They launched uh, recently the summer a global coalition to address synthetic drug threats, and that brings together a hundred countries. Um, so they're working on that. They are working in connection with the Mexican government. They just sanctioned a huge cartel through the financial side of it. Um, Treasury is looking at a strike force to target illicit uh, networks um, used by fentanyl traffickers. Um, there is a new framework with Mexico on the smuggling issue. And then, of course, when President Biden met with the Chinese President Xi, 
uh, they announced the resumption of a bilateral cooperation to reduce the flow of precursor chemicals. Um, on, the, on the prevention side, uh, there, President Biden has um, requested $26 billion in the FY24 process for prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery services. Uh, of course, the FY24 budget hasn't been completed by Congress yet. And he also has a supplemental um, spending request of $1.4 billion to stop the flow of fentanyl into the country uh, through additional um, customs and border patrol officers and also cutting edge detection devices. So there's been a lot of activity on the um, on the administration side of this. And I think uh, we can engage very much with the Biden administration as uh, as Jack said. One last question, I'll turn over to Commissioner Rubio. The, um, just wanna make sure that we're tracking potential law enforcement oriented grants in this area um, to the extent they arise, I know. Um, and I guess it's that leads to one last question. Is that Portland Police that's running point on tracking those, or um, is it your office? Who, who's primarily responsible for tracking available law enforcement grants right now? Yeah, I would say it's a definitely a collaboration. You know, we have our our goat team uh, keeping an eye closely on them. Vicky and and her firm um, do a lot of work to to you know cover the waterfront on on these opportunities. Um, I think a lot of the the funding specifically for this kind of work tends to flow through through HIDA and the DEA, the the High Intensity Drug Trafficking um, Task Force. Uh, so you know, I think where where we've seen success in our collaboration with PPB has been largely around um, equipment, uh, and so we'll we'll keep looking for opportunities. But but I think you know that's where where we've been mostly engaged around. Um, help, you know, going after some of the the DOJ grants that are are largely equipment based. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, so first, I just want to thank Jack and Vicky for the update. It's really great to hear. Also, the expansion of clean energy to include, or um, the energy efficiency beyond ener energy efficiency to include clean energy and renewables. That's really great and good movement. Um, my question is is about our agenda. I'm really pleased with um, our agenda. Um, what are you seeing? You know the landscape across the country right now. Are we? Um, are the things that that are, are on our agenda? Are they um, typical of things you're seeing in other cities of our size? Um, and also, my second question to that is: Are we going to see any concerted effort around housing or leadership around housing development specifically? Um, this year. Vicki, do you want to take the, the first part first and, and then I can help on the housing front? I will. Um, I represent a number of cities around the country in addition to uh, the city of Portland. And I think, um, you know, not to not to diss anybody, uh, you have one of the best, um, most thoroughly thought through uh, and and um, comprehensive and inclusionary in terms of talking to every bureau and every member of the city council um, and the mayor's office. So I think um, it's a pretty extraordinary and very um, top-notch federal agenda. That's great. And what, what does it look like in, in, in terms of what our agenda is compared to other cities? Are they are they having facing the similar similar issues, asking for the same things? Yes, yes, exactly. And it, it also, I think our agenda very closely aligns to the US Conference of Mayors and National League of Cities and their priorities as well. Affordable housing is a nationwide problem. Mm -hmm. And our focus on housing, um, I think, you know, is shared by everybody. Uh, and I think the fentanyl crisis is also something that is shared by most major cities in the United States. I would just add, I think that's consistent with what we really continue to see here in Oregon, which is this body is really out front and leading the way in terms of identifying these really critical issues that are are generating these crises around the fentanyl, around the public safety needs, around the, you know, the unsanctioned camping and, and these areas where we saw the legislature, you know, I, I kind of categorize this maybe uh, you know, five years ahead of other elected bodies in terms of really understanding how to address and beginning to call out the need to address some of these crises in the way that that we've identified, you've identified. Um, and but at the same time, uh, 
seeing those educational efforts, seeing that communication is really making a big difference in terms of moving the, those government bodies in the right direction. And I think the, the federal delegation is one where we're, we're going to continue to really need to do that educational work and have them uh, really tapping into and understanding some of those on the ground issues that that you're so articulate at, and, and we're going to continue to bring counsel into those conversations wherever we can. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll just add that I think, you know, we have a, a very comprehensive agenda, but it also, I think, does a really good job of balancing and, and focusing priorities. So it makes uh, my work and our, our team's work, I think, um, well directed to to be able to go after the, the large, you know, lowest hanging fruit and also um, spend time focusing on some of the more intractable problems. I think housing is is one of them where, you know, at a policy level, there's just, there is frankly a, a log jam in, in Congress that is unlikely to, to uh, you know, loosen, to, to loosen anytime soon. And, and so I think some of the most, um, you know, impactful policies, uh, frankly, unfortunately, we're just not going to see much movement at the at the federal level, but we do have a lot of strong um, partners. I mentioned, you know, the LIHTC work that, that Senator Wyden's helping lead. And, and I think, you know, they'll keep pushing and finding any opportunity to get to get small but meaningful victories. Um, and potentially, you know, every once in a while those seismic shifts occur where, where there is a breakthrough um, that, that has a large result. Um, but, you know, there is also plenty of funding opportunities out there that that short of the policy changes, uh, we can really actively go after. And, and I think in the coming year, you know, we can be even more ambitious in some of our earmark requests, particularly on the housing front. Right. Okay. And you'll let us know when those opportunities come up. So that they, they are going to come up spring. We've got the um, government relations and our, our go team has already sent out a, a save to the date to your offices for right. a, a January 11th workshop to, to talk about those. Thanks, Jack. Great. And uh, could I shift gears here just a little bit and talk about the state agenda? We are um, going to hand it off to the state team for, for a whole presentation. If, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll hold my comments on, on the federal agenda. I'll just say amen to, to what my colleagues have said. And um, I also want to note that this is, you know, with, with when Earl leaves next year, um, this is a very new delegation in the House. I mean, very new. And I, I wonder if any state in America will have as many new people in Congress as the state of Oregon. And that's a real challenge for us. That, that's not a personal jab at anybody who's in the delegation. It's just a reality given that this whole thing hinges upon seniority. And we, we won't have a lot of it. So I, I think there's an opportunity for us to collaborate more intentionally with our elected delegation members. Uh, I'm not really supposed to talk about politics, but I can't avoid it if we're talking about Congress. Uh, the you know, main congressional seat representing this city is an open seat. And I think all of us should be engaged in that race, however you want to be engaged. But I think we need to ask a lot of questions up front of the candidates in the district, those seeking to replace Earl Blumenauer, about what their level of commitment is to our city's agenda. And we should be really explicit about it. There's a lot of things we do at the city level that require us to be pragmatic and moderated in our views. For example, right-of-way maintenance, public safety related issues, policing, problematic camp cleanup. I wanna make sure that we get those candidates on the record in advance of the election as to where they stand. Are they going to be friend or foe to our agenda? We need to know. And no one else is gonna ask them. We have to ask them. So let's just make sure we all keep an eye on those congressional seats that that uh, potentially play a significant role in terms of whether or not we gain access to federal resources or not. And I'll just say um, Congress seems really far removed from me right now. 
And again, I'm speaking to the body at large. I'm not speaking to individual members. I've never seen Congress be more irrelevant to the day-to-day -day lives of Americans. And I, I really mean that. And it's sad to me. And so I want to make sure that we're not just sending somebody off to be part of the partisan bickering BS that seems to be overwhelming and overshadowing Congress. I want to make sure we send somebody there who has our agenda and our needs and our residents in mind first, foremost, and lastly, as they go to Congress. So uh, that that's just my commentary and uh, everybody can do with it what they want, but I, I just want to express that on my own behalf. Commissioner Gonzalez. You know, Commissioner, uh, Mayor Whaley, you raise an interesting question as well. What are the limits of appropriate engagement for us? Because I agree wholeheartedly with what you just said. I, I you know, we have to deal with the realities of urban living at a really difficult time in American history that forces us to be practical. We don't have a choice. And what we're all watching in Congress right now are new lows in, you know, every day. I mean, it's it it feels like. And it so I guess um I haven't been on city council in prior cycles. And you know, it's been a long time since Blumenauer's seat has been open. So it, it is I guess it's just a question for our government affairs team and really for you. What is an appropriate level of engagement uh, for city council on a on a seat like that? It is, it is a unique seat. I mean, it, it, you know, in, in many respects. You know, I, I think from OGR's perspective, we are a voice. We, we are helping facilitate a voice for the city. And I think those conversations amongst elected about what other electeds they need in, in the positions to support them. That is really, uh, uh, I think for you individually to kind of determine, we will be here to serve the city and to communicate with whomever is in those positions. And that's really where we land in terms of OGR. I, I, you know, we have our agenda, that, that, that's, that's the, the, the filter by which um, we're looking for partnerships with other government bodies, that, that that's probably the best I can tell you on that at this point. Um, you know, um, we we can circulate. Also, you know, we have um, information in terms of uh, where city employees can be engaged in certain kinds of activities, and we're happy to share uh, that information with your office as well. I, I do want to. Um, jump in here if this is appropriate and shift us into the state. Uh, uh, not, 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 not so fast. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to downplay this. And I, I realize there are prohibitions against city employees participating in campaign or you know, during work hours, of course. And, and we understand that. But this is our only chance to have our agenda clarified in advance of somebody being elected to that seat. Once somebody gets elected to that seat, you will not be able to dynamite them out of it. If they want to serve there for 30 years, they can serve there for 30 years. It is one of the safest seats in Congress. And so I just want to make sure that if there is an opportunity for us, either through our personal endorsement process or through our individual bully pulpits, or if there is something we can do collectively to bring the candidates together after work hours, just we elected folks and ask them point blank, where do they support the city's agenda and where do they disagree with the city's agenda? That would be good information to know now while they are candidates, as opposed to later when they become part of the machine that will ultimately consume them. That's my speech for the day. Now we can go to the state legislative agenda. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that um, comment and uh, observation. I, I am going to turn it over to our state relations uh, manager, Evan Mitchell, and she will introduce the team. Yeah, 
Thank you, Sam. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Uh, thank you for taking this time to review and discuss our legislative agenda. For the record, my name is Evan Mitchell. I'm your state relations manager. I use she, her pronouns, and I work closely with Director Chase, your offices, and the city bureaus to execute your policy agenda at the legislative, executive, and agency levels of the state. So the state team is presently made up of myself and one other full-time in-house lobbyist, Derek Bradley, who's here with us today. Um, we've just hired a new state associate to support our work, and you'll have the opportunity to meet her, Emily Pfeiffer, in the coming weeks. And we also have the great benefit of having Thorn Run partners on contract for the better part of the last year. While I know he needs no introduction, we're very happy to have uh, firm partner Dan Beats with us today. Uh, before we dig in, uh, Niels, can you go to the next slide, please? Before we dig into the draft legislative agenda, I wanted to provide a quick overview of the state landscape so that we have some framing and context as we talk about what happened in 2023 and what we anticipate in 2024. A lot of the same information was delivered to you by OGR this time last year, so I'll focus on what's different and what's changing since the last time you went through this process. Um, I think First, uh, I want to point out that former Portland and Multnomah County Auditor LaVon Griffin Belade is filling the rest of Shamia Fagan's term following her resignation earlier this year. We also ha um, have Treasurer Tobias Reed and Attorney General Rosenblum, who are completing their final year in their seats. Treasurer Reed is term limited, and AG R Rosenblum will retire after three terms in, this, in her seat. Next slide, please. This slide focuses on our legislative makeup. There have really been no major changes since uh, this was presented to you last year. I think the one thing I would note is that we have a new House Minority Leader, Representative Jeff Helfridge of Hood River, who is a former PPB officer, was elected as Minority Leader right shortly after uh, the long session ended. So the legislature remains split uh, with 35 Democrats and 25 Republicans in the House and 17 Democrats to 12 Republicans in the Senate with one, occasionally two independents who tend to break with the Republicans. Uh, next slide, please. Just a quick reminder, we have a, a really large and diverse Portland delegation with about 15 House members and eight senators that have some portion of Portland within their districts. Uh, next slide. So I'd be remiss, and you already started talking about this a bit, if I didn't talk about the November 2024 election as a part of the landscape for our work in the legislature. As you already know, the Speaker of the House, Dan Rayfield of Corvallis, has said that he will continue to preside through the 2024 legislative session, even though he's running for Attorney General. He doesn't have any significant opposition yet. Um, so this makes sense, especially given that community safety is going to be a major focus in the 2024 session. Should he draw a major opponent in the next month, his decision may change. So that's something that we'll be watching. Two Portland delegation members and chairs of important House committees have also announced that they're running for Congress. So Rep. Janelle Bynum, whose district does not technically include any of Portland after redistricting, but whom runs a business in Portland and is still very much an honorary member of the Portland delegation. She also chairs the House Committee on Small Business and Economic Development and, and is active in sort of bringing the city of Portland into that space and having conversations, is running for uh, CD5. We also have Rep. Maxine Dexter, who represents Northwest Portland and a small portion of North Portland and serves currently as the chair of the House Committee on Housing and Homelessness, just announced last week that she'll be running for CD3. Uh, as the House runs every two years, both Rep. Bynum and Dexter will not be seeking re-election to their current seats. Uh, another person who's running that I want to flag is, um, while he's not in the Portland area, I, I do want to note that both Treasurer Tobias Reed and Senator James Manning of Eugene, who is the chair of the Senate Committee on Veterans Emergency Management, Federal and World Affairs, uh, are both running for Secretary of State. And then last but certainly not least, Senator Elizabeth Steiner is running midterm to be Oregon's next treasurer. Her chances look really good. 
at the moment, which could mean there'll be a vacancy in the Senate co-chair of the Joint Committee on Ways and Means. There's plenty of conjecture about who will be up for that seat, but it's unlikely that we will know um, who the Senate would put, select for that position until much later next year. Next slide, please. There's also, uh, you know, another element that is worth mentioning is the anticipated ballot measures that are coming, which will color the legislative process. Uh, this is by no means a complete list. It's just a few of the measures out there that we wanted to highlight, and there are probably more coming. I think first on here, I wanted to point out that um, the ranked choice voting measure, which was legislative re legislatively referred, to ask Oregon voters to affirm the use of ranked choice voting for federal and state elected positions. If approved, ranked choice voting would not be implemented statewide until 2027. During the 2023 session, we worked with the ranked choice voting coalition to make sure that those efforts would not in any way affect the rollout of the city of Portland's ranked choice voting efforts. And we'll continue to work with that, with the coalition and with the Secretary of State's office and the county to, to monitor this work and ensure there's a maximum alignment between the city, county, and state. Uh, another one that seems to be gaining some momentum with a professional consultant recently hired is the um, ballot measure that would require voters to approve the use of highway tolls in nearby areas. Given ODOT's financial woes and that a tolling system in the metro region will need to be designed and implemented to cohesively to minimize uh, diversion, this is a measure that we will be watching closely as the impacts could be quite significant. And finally, I think this one is on everybody's radar, but there's a, a twin set of measures introduced to reform ballot measure 110. Uh, I'd be happy to spend time talking to each of you sort of point by point on each of these measures and the differences between them um, outside of this work session. Uh, but I wanted to flag that uh, the introduction of these measures, along with our, your council, your call for legislative action to address public consumption, helped pressure the legislature into creating the Joint Committee on Addiction and Public Safety Response, which is developing a community safety and behavioral health package for the legislature to take up during the 2024 session. We'll talk more about that committee and their work in a little bit. These ballot measures are really important. They'll play a critical role um, in the short session as they continue to sort of act as a measuring stick for the work of the legislature. Next slide, please. Um, as we talked about or referenced earlier in the presentation, uh, as we're shifting to a biennial agenda setting process, we carried forward many, uh, we carried forward all of the 2023 legislative agenda that wasn't yet accomplished, including the major buckets that were used to categorize the city priorities and policy positions. These um, are slightly different than what Jack walked through, but very, very similar uh, and, and should be very familiar to you. The, our agenda generally falls under the categories of housing and homelessness, community safety and behavioral health, economic recovery and development, environmental justice, climate and infrastructure. And then we have a catch-all category for all the issues associated with like local funding and authority, which uh, having this basically allows your city, lob your lobby team to act defensively to protect the city um, and our ability to do business, raise revenue, defend against unfunded mandates, and generally act advocate for maximum local control. Next slide, please. Uh, and one last quick note before we go into the agenda, I wanna mention the important role that the League of Oregon Cities plays in augmenting our capacity and supporting our needs during the session. The list of items on this screen represents just a handful of the major issues they took the lead on or provided substantial staff time and support on during 2023. Having LOC in the legislature gives us the ability to focus more of our energy on your key priorities because we know we have lobbyists in the building who understand the nuts and bolts of running a city who will flag and dig into the issues that could impact our operations and authorities the behind the scenes work that loc does to defend against our uh, against unnecessary and costly changes to employment procurement public records public meetings laws 
uh, has a good return on investment. While these areas can be somewhat mundane, their technical nature makes them more time consuming for us to learn and to explain in a meaningful way to the legislators and their staff, which then takes away from our efforts to proactively advance the city's agenda. So, um, I, and this isn't to say that LOC only tackles the sort of mundane and technical stuff of operating the city. Their lobbyists also play key roles in housing, economic development, finance, public safety, and infrastructure spaces. And I think we can safely say that these are the people we lean on and trust the most to help us accomplish the city's agenda in Salem. So next slide. Before I hand it over to Dan to talk about housing and homelessness, I want to really underscore a couple of important um, items to keep in mind as you think about our 2024 legislative agenda. The short legislative sessions are incredibly truncated. With only 35 days, that means that a bill has to move out of a committee within the first week to continue on in the process. This also means that an amendment can pretty easily kill a bill just due to timing. Legislators are only given two priority bills they can personally introduce, so there's just not a lot of slack and extra opportunity to introduce bills, particularly at the last minute. It also means that a lot of more, a lot more of the work has to take place before session, given the timelines. And as such, controversy and disagreement can easily overwhelm and kill a bill. So um, Last thing I wanted to note, as my colleagues walk through the policy agenda, they're going to go back and forth between the 2023 session highlights and the draft 2024 agenda. We're happy to take questions as we go, but also wanted to note that not every single accomplishment or agenda item are included on the slides. For a more thorough look, we would refer you to the draft agenda provided for this work session and our 2023 legislative session report, which we can send out and is also on the OGR website. And that covers a lot of the or all of the work that we did during the 2023 legislative session. So with that, please take it away, Dan. Mayor Wheeler, city commissioners, thank you for uh, having us here today. It has been a great honor uh, to represent you all um, for the last year. And uh, for the record, my name's uh, Dan Bates. I'm a partner with Thorn Run Partners. I use he, him pronouns. And I also want to acknowledge uh, two key members from Thorn Run, Rachel Wiggins Emery and Tyler Jansen, who many of you had the opportunity to work with when you were in Salem and visiting. Um, uh, representing Port uh, Portland is uh, part of our DNA. And so we're just super pleased to be here uh, today. And we'll walk through some of these slides before I turn it back over. And I'll, I'll, uh, I do want to say um, just that you have a great OGR team. Uh, they are a team that um, we, we spend every day in the Capitol and get to see those that come and go. And your team is always present, always pursuing different opportunities for the city and very, very active uh, and couldn't, uh, couldn't be better partners uh, as we work through these um, issues together. So in terms of highlights on the housing and homelessness um, agenda, uh, the city was out early and very vocal about its needs, uh, its needs and what it needed from the state. Uh, the governor and the legislature uh, delivered two major investments in housing that were historic. Uh, and for our purposes, uh, those those two packages produced uh, seven million dollars for the temporary alternative sites, which came through the emergency order uh, that the governor instituted that was ultimately funded by HB 5019. Uh, the second heavy investment package uh, was uh, the o uh, Oregon Housing Community Services budget, which was Senate Bill 5511, and that produced uh, 45 on million ongoing dollars for shelter operations that was intended to fund on an ongoing way uh, the shelter funding in the initial emergency order. Uh, our back of the envelope uh, analysis would be that that would produce around 10.8 million, which is what you see on there uh, for the TAS site. Um, as we actually dug down in the city, took a hard look at the cost. Uh, what we submitted was closer, it was a little over 13 million. Uh, as Director Chase mentioned, uh, we are awaiting uh, a response from OHCS as they uh, determine how to distribute those dollars. Uh, we have been encouraged by the feedback and want to thank all of you for the advocacy on that. Uh, in this two-step process that will ultimately uh, make those investments critical um, uh, happen. The city was also very engaged in strongly supported a tax exemption 
uh, for commercial to residential housing retrofits. And the city was the lead on a technical fix to the way that land use appeals work uh, in the process in that process. And those were some of the highlights. As, as Evan mentioned, there are more in the packet, but I wanted to highlight those um, and uh, as we move forward uh, to the next uh, slide, which is our, our draft agenda, which is really in many ways a continuation, uh, as the director uh, mentioned earlier and Evan just also alluded to, which is there is ongoing need, uh, as was made very clear yesterday by the mayor at the business summit uh, and joined by the governor in this same space. And so uh, as the governor's announced uh, her top priority in a $600 million uh, proposal around housing um, uh, across the spectrum uh, of those types of, uh, of projects, the city is going to continue and we intend to be engaged and being very opportunistic in both ways that we can secure affordable and workforce housing as part of the package, but also uh, if there's going to be additional funding on shelters, uh, that the temporary alternative shelter sites and the safe rest villages uh, are a key factor uh, as folks determine where best to put funds. Uh, the city has been engaged for uh, a long time now in making that case and showing great results. Uh, the other key priorities that uh, the city will be focused on is around uh, infrastructure funding. Um, again, uh, the the city joined its colleagues, uh, other cities around the state in demonstrating uh, in the midst of the housing production discussion that the infrastructure that is related to housing uh, is really key. And uh, that will be a, a significant agenda item. The city is also going to be supportive of streamlining the home ownership limited tax exemption process, a, a bill that we worked on in this last session that will continue to do that work. But that's the overall um, uh, key draft agenda issues uh, before we move on to the to the next slide, which is the next area of focus for the city, community safety and behavioral health. In terms of some highlights from the 2023 session, uh, the legislature did criminalize possession of certain amounts of fentanyl, named fentanyl in statute, expanded access to naloxone, invested in increasing residential treatment capacity, and increased access to public defenders. Uh, more more is uh, needs to be done there, as we'll talk about on the agenda, but made, made some progress. The city also successfully increased penalties for street racing uh, through, through legislation. And one area that the city was particularly active on and, and worked regionally with its partners here and other law enforcement agencies and public uh, safety agencies around the state was to increase capacity for police training at DPSST uh, the, the governor ended up proposing an increase in academies in, in a pilot project. The legislature went even beyond that and worked with the governor and the agency uh, and the city and others uh, to actually pilot going with larger academies uh, to try and move through this backlog. It appears to be working. The backlog is shrinking, but there's significant work that needs to be done there uh, to, in, in an ongoing way, but was uh, a, a great partnership between the local governments the city of Portland and the legislature and the, the agency there. Finally, the city uh, worked to exempt disclosure of public employees and retirees' personal information uh, in legislation to make sure that uh, we're able to um, protect those that, that work with us uh, in, in their privacy. Uh, on the next slide, which is the uh, draft agenda uh, for the community safety behavioral health uh, again, as as was illustrated yesterday, uh, and in a place where the city has been out in front and early leadership passing in its ordinance, was the agenda item of banning public use of drugs, and uh, that uh, received uh, accolation yesterday. Uh, there's significant momentum. The legislature has formed the joint committee on addiction and community safety response to deal with this issue. Uh, the mayor testified uh, at that committee. Um, and we we hope to see those recommendations coming out in mid-January uh, when they've have sort of indicated that they will reveal what that will, will look like. The city will continue through uh, the Office of Government Relations and our work uh, to advance that key priority. What is also very key in that is stabilization beds for first responder drop-off um, over and over again. It's, it's clear that this is a system uh, that that enforcement alone won't solve. And it was even mentioned earlier in this presentation today, uh, 
Uh, it's a continuum, and it's critical that the state invest uh, in this space, particularly uh, for us to be successful. And so that is a, a top key priority in this area. Finally, as Director Chase uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, that in yesterday's uh, announcement of the Central City Task Force, uh, the city has been very vocal uh, in leading uh, the, the plea uh, for the state to invest uh, in cleaning up the Oregon Department of Transportation sites that go through the city of Portland from graffiti uh, and litter uh, and, and garbage. Uh, the, the announcement yesterday was a $20 million ask uh, to the legislature that the governor indicated that she would champion with the legislature. Uh, and as the mayor indicated, uh, we, we will continue to advocate for that as we have been. Uh, and, and I think there is significant momentum there in another critical, important piece. The other element I would add as an agenda item is that uh, the city will end up being supportive of a community corrections funding and formula fix, assuming that the agenda is adopted. Uh, these uh, overall, again, these are the big, big picture agenda items uh, that have consumed our time in the last year. As Evan mentioned, uh, much of a short session is spent working the day that you get out of the long session. And so we've been working on these issues, seeing fruit, but more work needs to, to continue to proceed. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Derek Bradley, your state lobbyist with the Office of Government Relations, uh, who we were arm in arm with in the halls in Salem this past year. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Mayor Wheeler, members of the council, for the record, my name is Derek Bradley, he, him, state lobbyist for City of Portland. The legislature made historic investments in semiconductors during the 23 legislative session. The city does not have the land for the investments around industrial production, but local businesses can apply for research funding created by the state package. $700 million in broadband investments are coming to Oregon from the federal government. The state needed to make changes to be eligible for the maximum amount. The city worked to ensure that urban communities with insufficient broadband, such as large portions of East Portland, would be eligible for some of the funding coming down the pipeline. There is more work to be done to ensure investments and programming support under <clears throat> to ensure investments and programming support underserved areas, as well as the completely unserved areas across rural and frontier Oregon. The Sunset for Enterprise Zones program was extended to 2032, allowing the city to continue utilizing this important economic tool. Continued investments were made to help remediate brownfields, allowing them to become developable properties. We expect these conversations to continue as the state continues to discuss investments in housing production. Next slide, please. State, we expect major investments in housing, including the infrastructure associated with new housing in 2024, followed by an expansive transportation bill in 2025. We will continue to work to maximize economic development opportunities as the state considers investments in housing, community safety, and infrastructure. We anticipate investments in housing and related infrastructure to be the main economic development related action taken during the short session in 2024. Next slide, please. Investments in arts and culture play an important role in our economy and are foundational to a thriving city. In 2023, the legislature made some specific investments in arts venues in Portland and around the state to help sustain these organizations as they continue to recover from the pandemic. While this funding was greatly appreciated, more is needed to bolster arts and culture as part of our recovery strategy. To do this, we will support the newly formed Legislative Arts Caucus and members of the Portland delegation in advocating for additional investments to support arts and cultural institutions in Portland. Next slide, please. The legislature passed a large climate package that focused on leveraging available federal resources by making state investments in accelerating heat pump deployment, expanding tree canopies, and piloting resilience hubs. Additionally, the 2023 session included a historic $250 million in bonding as the state's first payment towards the new Interstate 5 bridge. This will be followed by three subsequent bonding actions taken over the next three biennium, which will fulfill the state's needed $1 billion investment in the bridge. Next slide, please. A few months ago, this council passed a resolution directing OGR to advocate for resources for environmental mitigation, including seeking funding to provide or purchase mitigation credits in the floodplain along the Willamette River. As the legislature continues to focus on housing production, there has been some conversation related to state resources for environmental mitigation, 
but it's not clear if resources will be committed to these efforts as a part of the 2024 housing package. OGR will actively monitor and engage in those ongoing conversations. As you know, Commissioner Maps, work has been underway for many years to both stabilize the levees and related flood control infrastructure along the Columbia River and to complete the federally mandated Bull Run water filtration system. As the city has done before, we will continue to support the Levee Ready Columbia Coalition's efforts to put a governance system in place that will stabilize and maximize federal investment in the Columbia River levee system. We will also elevate and advocate for needs associated with the Bull Run filtration project. On the transportation infrastructure front, conversations are already underway around the 2025 transportation package. The city is participating in a number of tables advocating for a transportation package that will meet our needs. Positing the city's needs and priorities in the 2025 transportation package will be a major body of work for OGR in both 2024 and 2025. With that upcoming package, we do not anticipate significant transportation bills during the 2024 session. Finally, while it isn't listed on the slide, you will see on our draft agenda continued support for reducing carbon emissions in the transportation sector. Many legislators continue to want to find ways to increase investments to reduce carbon emissions in transportation, including investments in transit, electric vehicle rebates, alternative fuel deployment, and improving biking and pedestrian infrastructure. While we do not anticipate any large scale investments in this area in 2024, it is possible that some programming dollars will be made available, which is something we will track and continue to advocate for. We're ha happy to answer any questions you may have on these items. First, I will turn it back over to Sam to close out our presentation. Commissioner Maps, did you want to go ahead and go, or Sam, did you have more? Uh, no, no, I was just trying to get off mute. Please, questions. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Gonzalez. I think had his hand up first. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, yep. uh, appreciate. It. Um, very uh, supportive of the priorities articulated at the state level. A couple of areas of interest. Um, any appetite right now to address civil commitment in the state of Oregon? You know, we just saw our neighbors to the south in California um addressed this very directly it was embraced by the city and county of san francisco um you know we we are seeing some movement even in similarly positioned um states uh frankly uh to be more proactive on this uh, issue and um i'm just curious you know what your sense is i mean and for those listening at home uh, the state of Oregon has some of the highest standards, if not the highest standards in the country for civil commitment. Um, it is a material barrier to intervening on uh, in those who are engaging really self-destructive behavior. We see it manifests itself every single day on the streets of Portland, uh, even after our first responders intervene. Um, it, it is a very serious issue for us. And so I, that's the reason for the question. Just curious what you sense at the state level there right now. Yeah, um, I, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a really important one. I'll take a crack and then invite Dan uh, to add anything if I if I missed anything. I think so. Where we are right now, we've come a long way in the conversation about civil commitment over the last couple of years. Again, this is a place where the city's kind of been out in front, saying things that were not initially politically popular, but that the legislature is sort of caught up with us on. There's a a work group that's being convened by. Judge Nan Waller, who's who are specifically putting together sort of a package of recommendations for the 2025 session. So I don't anticipate that we're going to see a tremendous amount in 2024, but I do think there are some key pieces that legislators are looking at. We're aware of um, at least one bill that is considering, you know, how could uh, piloting a program to expand. Uh, police ability and behavioral health ability around uh, holds. And so I think we're seeing real real momentum moving in that area. And I think we're going to see a package in 2025. Okay. Well, just let me know how I, our office can help there. Uh, second general category, I mean, this is my question for Dan or, or, uh, or well, either of you. Um, you know, we we met with President Wagner last week, uh, raised a concern about state preemption, specifically House Bill 3115, um, which 
uh, frankly interferes with the city's uh, ability to address unsanctioned camping on our streets. There's a whole progeny of legislation in that area, including RVs, uh, the Commissioner Maps has to deal with, and um, uh, further, uh, you know, codifying notice requirements. Um, you know, I this is I, I'm I'm making a plea here. You know, I know there's not going to be big pots of gold in this next legislative session, but at minimum, asking the state legislature to get out of the way of the city of Portland, and I'll defer to you and how to say that as diplomatically as possible. Um, uh, you guys are quite good at that, but um, you know, Portland residents are responding more direct response. We are doing everything we can to do that and to get to the end of a process and for state law to be interfering with our ability to address the crisis on our streets is extremely frustrating. And so I guess that's just the question is, is what can we do on the preemption question this cycle? Across the board, outdoor drug consumption, camping, but just, just the, the, you know, across the board. I'm I'm happy to to take a crack. I think, you know, we've talked about this before, Commissioner Gonzalez, and um, there are judicial processes going that I think we need to see how those play out, and we'll continue to watch those closely and uh, have conversations with the legislature about how the city is impacted by those decisions. I, I pretty regularly hear certain legislators comment about, um, you know, past decisions that may have been made that have made it harder. I think we're seeing openings to have those conversations. And the fact that we've got, you know, public consumption and ODOT funding and a civil commitment package coming into it, these are, you know, market improvements from when I started a year ago. And so, um, we are making progress. We're having those conversations. You all are helping us tremendously in sort of demonstrating the the depth of the impact. And we'll need to keep doing that and looking, we'll keep looking for the opportunities to uh, have those conversations so that the legislators, particularly in Portland, understand and leadership understand the impacts. Uh, Got it. One last area of questions. I'll turn over to my colleagues on criminal justice. What is the current coordination with LIPSIC? I was so happy to see uh, the focus on corrections funding. And I mean, I, a whole nother subject of how we've underfunded that for a decade and we're feeling it very uh, mightily in this in this community. But what is um, is it? What is the coordination between your office and LIPSIC on on some of the joint ask? Uh, the, another really good question. This is an, actually an area that I've been thinking about a lot lately because I think we need to ramp up our coordination with LIPSIC. I think traditionally we've in, um, sort of relied on the appointed elected official who serves on LIPSIC to flag issues. And then also with our partners at the county, we work really closely with the government relations team at the county and they're you know, very active in LIPSIC. But as... Um, criminal justice and you know, restorative justice and those issues continue to be major focuses. Uh, I've been talking to Abby and looking for opportunities for ways for us to, to Im not improve, but bolster our coordination so that we can support each other in Salem. Okay, just let me know what our office can do to help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank staff for the, uh, their work in this field and today's presentation. I think my question really focuses in on the short session. I believe I've heard the governor say her top priority for the short session um, is housing, and I think she has a bill that she is going to bring that would add about $500 million uh, to housing production. Um, I'm curious to if staff knows what's in that bill um, in more detail and what implications it has for Portland. I can take that, Commissioner. Thanks for the question. Uh, oh, thanks, Derek. We are learning more specific details with each passing week. Um, the call out for 500 million for housing production specifically and 100 million for houseless services is a rather new detail. We are there's no LC drafted yet, we know, and we are 
I know we are I'm waiting on some processing work by the Housing Bureau on a draft of their newest numbers that have come out that are not they're very, they're still not very detailed. The big chunks are going to be uh, infrastructure dollars associated with housing. There was a big call out to sort of get a analysis of what cities need for large scale infrastructure projects. Will be land acquisition, and there will be more money for up for you real quick. Potentially, this is again not even written in a in a draft yet. So, financing for workforce housing is going to be probably where we see most of the money, uh, which is traditionally defined as 80% to under 20% AMI. That's all very rough, though, at the moment. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Yeah, I couldn't find, well, you provided more details than I've been able to find online. Uh, one of the requests um, um, I have is if we can get, I'd love it if we can get more detail about what's likely to be in that bill. And I hope that before the legislative session starts, like, which I think is in early February or something like that, um, the city has a chance to do some modeling about the impact that these dollars would have on housing production here in Portland. Um, some of the ideas that have been floated, um, I think, make a lot of sense. Some. Uh, Let me start off by sending you, Commissioner. So there was a call. This wasn't from the governor's office specifically. This came from League of Oregon Cities yep. for master cities to submit master plan projects that basically, if we got this money we could start breaking ground on some of these projects in six to 12 months, large scale. And so the city uh, submitted some very great number crunching by a number of bureaus around uh, the OMSI build out and right. Broadway corridor. And okay. I can send you that right up. I can send your office that right up right now. Uh, great. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate this. And uh, um, I look, I'll engage with commissioner Rubio on this uh, question too. I think we probably lost her to another meeting or at least I don't see her right now. Uh, thank you very much. I'll lower my hand. I also just want to quickly add that the, the, the governor is currently in the process of sort of putting out her legislative request, and it's not quite, you know, it's not quite in bill form. We're going to be working with the co-chairs of the committees that will be taking up these decisions. We also, I think, will have a, a, an important role to play to make sure that urban, particularly city of Portland region, gets its fair share in terms of how housing dollars are allocated. I think there is, uh, we have seen a tendency among the legislature to say, well, you have the supportive housing services bond and you have your own bond measures for housing. And so therefore we should use those dollars elsewhere. And so I think you all play an incredibly important role in making sure that the governor leadership, our legislators understand that why we need those dollars, why they need to invest, not just on in you know the edges of the urban growth boundaries, but actually building in the city. And so um, it will be important. Thank you for that clarification. And that is um, one of the um, points I want to um, explore when I look at the language around that proposed bill. I'm not sure if this is bill is designed to uh, promote housing development in Portland or other places. Certainly some language I've seen seems to suggest that it's not Portland specific uh, um, and maybe explicitly not Portland in that it's focused in on small or smaller communities. Um, and I just sure, sure hope that uh, we at least have a discussion around that before mm -hmm. or during the legislative session. The city, Thanks. our office is continued to uh, have conversations with, and it's a great point and an important point. And we've continued to press that both to legislative leaders and the governor's office about the, the um, you know, I really think that if, Portland is shortchanged on this. It's not going to help other communities because they're going to have people that like people are going to leave from Portland and go to other places yeah. in the state, and that's not going to help them. And so I think the message is so far being well received by legislative leaders and by the governor's office. Um, there will be a lot of work on making sure, though, that the city does get its fair share of resources, which will help, you know, everyone. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Evelyn and Evan and uh, Derek, Dan, all your team members, especially Rachel. Hello, Rachel. Uh, let's get started here. One, I'm just say this really quick. When I hear workforce housing 80% above, we all know that's not true. Um, what really is workforce housing in Portland? 
is I wish that they were having a systemic conversation about 45%, because when we look at essential workers, that seemed to be a sweet spot. And there's a big gap between 30% and 60%. So if um, they wanted to have a really serious conversation about systemic changes, I hope that they, that conversation gets some life to it. Okay, but what I really want to talk about is it was so wonderful to see the stabilization beds for individuals transported by first responders. We all know this is a big need. I, it reminds me how we got um, all of us on this council at that time to pass the Safe West Villages in July of 2021. Uh, it reminds me of some similar parallel construct. And that was trying to make the case, which I was able to make here, but it was difficult once we went beyond city council, that we needed a transition from chronic homelessness to being is having a shot at being successful in permanent housing. And we are moving too many people. And we had a lot of stories that no one wanted to talk about of taking um, people from the streets into uh, permanent housing and it didn't go so well. And it, it, it cost us a lot of money to repair those units. And again, that those stories are out there, they're everywhere. And so I think um, we're seeing now that the proof points are promising. And so that transition is now made its way to people in the state that three years ago, two years ago, didn't want to participate in it, and now they're all in. So that's good. I think we have a similar construct here with our addiction crisis. Uh, everyone's getting quickly addicted. It's easy and accessible. And the horrific withdrawal period is something that behavioral health doctors don't even know how to speak about. And politicians are having a really hard time finding their voice on this. And I found that yesterday, even in our gathering at, at the Moda Center. So I believe we need to really promote, once again, the city can be in front about that transition from being addicted on the streets to the cheap, inaccessible drugs that are everywhere in the open market to um, a type of withdrawal center that we don't even understand yet. But why can't Portland, Oregon, which seems to be the headline on this topic, be the innovator to actually try this out? We're going to learn from it. And the the political will is, seems to be starting to finally show up at our public health, behavioral health, local entity, which is a county. And, and I, I do notice that some of the reps in Salem are beginning to understand this conversation. And so I think it's really important that we go hard on building those transitions um, for stabilization beds. And they're not going to be like anything we've seen in the past. And so we have to get honest about that. Um, that's always the first step to recovery. And in the political arena, we need to lean into that. And let's let Portland once again be the leader. Um, I know that this is bipartisan. I know that city council members across the city understand this issue. And so again, this is an opportunity to actually do something with both sides of the aisle um, it, that, that's common sense. I actually think the arts caucus also could be bipartisan. Um, this is an economic driver everywhere. And we know that arts organizations took the biggest hits during COVID and have had the hardest time getting people to return to their facilities. This impacts communities across the state, it, uh, not just in Portland. It's a little bit more severe here, but we really um, have an opportunity to be all in on this. And I look forward to finding my voice and working with all of you to get some much needed money, or we're gonna see some of our most beloved organizations close this year. And that will be quite devastating for the city of Portland. And as the major league city of our state will be quite a punch in a gut to the entire state of Oregon. So let's also continue to go hard on um, getting some real cash that would be like emergency grants to keep our arts organizations alive and well in 2024. Thanks. Thank you. And I, I just have one question that I'll add at this point. Um, and it may be way too early to tell, but I, I was following the Portland public schools strike closely. And I believe the messaging that's coming out of that is that there is a significant gap that Portland public schools needs to fill. There's also a lot of pressure being felt in other school districts around the state. And if I had to guess, if it was our legislative agenda versus schools, schools wins every time. What influence will 
school funding have either in the short session or the subsequent long session in 2025? Does, does anybody have a crystal ball here? Mayor, I think you've you've hit on a really important dynamic, but we don't have any clear answers for you yet on it. The governor is convening folks to have discussions about the the way we fund education. And I think you know we'll see those progress and, and watch those as they progress. The the thing that gives me some uh, I don't want to use the word hope because obviously funding our schools is really important, but but does sort of help me in thinking about our agenda is the governor has been so vocally committed to that housing to her housing agenda item. So she's going to have to find a way to balance the between these different priorities. Most likely no one will be happy, which is probably the sign of a decent compromise. But I think at this point, we we can't even begin to predict exactly how that shakes out. Let, let me ask the question slightly differently. And I, and I appreciate it because I, I can't predict it either. Um, do we have any sense of the dynamic given that the governor's priority now stated publicly is housing? There will undoubtedly be a coordinated effort probably in the 2025 legislative session. I'm, I'm guessing this is more of a, a long session rather than a short session push. Where does that leave agenda items related to health, human services, livability, the kinds of things that, that we tend to go to the legislature to support? Are, are we a distant cousin in this Make up because I, 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 I'm thinking about the Metropolitan Mayors Association effort, our ill fated effort last session, where we brought together dozens of communities around the state with a relatively modest ask around what's clearly one of the public's top priorities, which is getting people off the streets and connected to services. And we got nowhere, it died in committee, meaning it was quietly killed by people who share our constituencies. And so I'm sitting here thinking now, that was that was not a session where there was a marquee issue like housing or school, certainly nothing of that magnitude. So I'm, I'm just trying to be realistic about what the fate of our legislative agenda will be if it becomes a housing and or schools balancing act. We really don't stand a prayer of a chance, do we? I think the other element that we have to think about in all of this, and I, I'll, I'll invite Dan to, to comment as well, is the outcome of the election. So I think the 2024 election is going to play a really important role in, in what the 2025 priorities look like. Um, and certainly from polling and the information that we have now the public is going is currently looking for solutions and action on housing homelessness behavioral health addiction and the legislative leaders know that so i don't think it's quite as black and white as you're laying it out a prayer of a chance on any of it i just think it'll probably not be ex it won't be as grand as we hoped yeah no um, i i i i uh, appreciate your optimism and again this this is probably more geared towards 2025 rather than the short session people haven't really coalesced yet there isn't leadership there isn't a specific concrete set of proposals around education yet and um I, I'm, I'm just thinking that while the public has priorities, the legislators aren't stupid. They know that people aren't going to call their legislative representative to complain about a homeless camp in their backyard or near their school or in their park. They're going to call us. And the legislator, legislature demonstrated a lack of willingness to support even a modest ask made by a significant number of cities across this state. They stiff-armed us. And so my my real, and I guess maybe I'm just saying this as a cautionary note, I won't be here, but that legislative agenda in 2025 is going to be really important. There's going to have to be a lot of lead into that legislative session to get commitments from specific legislators 
specifically the Portland delegation, they need to commit publicly to the agenda or we're not going to get anything if it comes to public safety, infrastructure, homelessness versus education. Education will win. And I'm not saying it shouldn't, it probably should, but we have to carve out enough to address the withering needs here in the community. And in the absence of that, I think we'll come out of that legislative session losers. That's my prediction. Mayor, if, if, if I might, I mean, I, I think that's uh, astute. I also think it's uh, it will be a return to normal. And, and I think we have actually been in this um, a strange season since the Student Success Act, in which education funding hasn't been the dominant politic in the legislature, uh, because there was um, enough for a while. And uh, I think one of the things that you've probably heard from legislative leaders is this curiosity of how they could have gotten it wrong. They thought they had been producing a a number; it was supposed to be sufficient. And lo and behold, it was not. And I think there's there will be a lot of interest, in, which probably does take it to 25, as folks try and figure out, again, what is the right level of funding uh, for the types of schools that we want, um, which which moves us back into a space where the human services and the issues that we that are just so present today uh, will once again be fighting with education. But that has actually been the long arc of conflict, mm -hmm. um, which is why we've had these moments in the past where we've talked about things like tax reform and, and are there other ways to give local governments more tools? Uh, those are also under pressure uh, as as the, the tax burden has risen. So it's not an easy negotiation in that regard. But I do think um, we are setting ourselves back into a place uh, that has been traditional. And you have to make the case in different ways. And you have to demonstrate why public safety and the issues that we're facing today are actually really critical to a positive educational outcome. Um, and and I think there are ways to make that case. There are ways to link that up. Um, but I do think that that um, that conflict in funding is returning. Uh, it'll probably be until twenty five before those real politics are are fully fully together. And couldn't agree more about um, how important then it turns that agenda. Yeah, that that's a good analysis, Dan. I I appreciate that. Again, it's it's early here and it's easy to speculate maybe it won't turn out that way at all but it's it's just something we should be prepared for commissioner ryan you get the last word yeah i i know a little bit about this issue and it's so much about declining enrollments that really uh, uh suffer when a school district suffers is when there's declining enrollment so all the other topics we've been going at especially around public safety around our drug crisis is why people are fleeing, not just the city of Portland, but the state of Oregon. And so uh, let's look at the migration, sadly, uh, families leaving as the real issue and how to keep them in our school districts, in our cities, which is the lifeblood of all of our uh, economies. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure that we know that there's a big decline enrollment concern right now with PPS and surrounding districts. Thanks. Yeah, good, good, good insight. Well, I, I want to thank, uh, uh, my colleagues, great discussion. I want to thank all of our government relations folks. Uh, as per always, uh, you impress. Thank you. We're really, really lucky to have you representing us at the, the state level as well as the federal level. And just a reminder that uh, OGR is going to be returning to council on January 10th of 2024 for approval of the agendas. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you, everybody. We are adjourned.